Good morning. This is Stewardship Month, and on this second Sunday, I'd like to use as a sermonic theme, making the most of what you have. Making the most of what you have. Malala Yousaf, Malala Yousaf, Muyala, okay, I worked hard. <laughs> I worked hard on getting this together. I got my pronunciation all written out and still. Malala Yousafzai was born in northern Pakistan on July 12, 1997. She was born at home because her parents could not afford to give birth to her in a hospital. Her name, Malala, means grief-stricken. Malala's father recognized that she was special and he would let her stay up at night to talk about politics. From a very early age, Malala wanted to be a doctor, but her dad said, hey, I think you really have a gift for politics. He nurtured his daughter. He was an educator himself, and he nurtured her interest in politics. In 2008, there was an anonymous blogger on BBC who stepped down because her parents feared for her life. Malala stepped in and became an anonymous reporter for BBC talking about the growth of the Taliban in her community. She would hand in written notes that she had written to a journalist, and that journalist would email it in to BBC. The Taliban came out with an edict that girls could not go to school. Some of this story I know is already familiar to you. Over 100 schools were blown up. The schools finally, almost after a year, opened back up. Malala went back to school. The BBC documentary ended, but the New York Times now wanted to pick up her story. She was growing in popularity and she was no longer anonymous, but she became a voice for girls. Desmond Tutu nominated her for an award and applauded her speaking out on behalf of girls being entitled to get an education. Her dad, though, was receiving death threats. Now there are death threats and then there are death threats. When you get a death threat from the Taliban, you should not take that lightly at all. In 2012, a Taliban meeting was held and one member stood up and agreed that he would be the person that would kill Malala. On October the 12th, you know this story, she's riding to school on a school bus. A guy entered the bus and asked, who is Malala on the bus? At first, she didn't raise her hand, but he asked the question again, and she stood up and identified herself. At that point, he pulled out a gun and shot her, almost point zero range, in her head. For six years, Malala experienced an exile from her own country. It simply was not safe to go back home to the place she was born, to the place where she learned her values, to the place where she was nurtured in politics. We're talking about exile this morning. I'd like to drop one more name on you before we enter the biblical text. And this person's name is Mai Khoi. Mai Khoi is a pop star singer in Vietnam, or was. She talked about women's freedoms and her own personal choice. She decided early in life that she didn't want to have children. Her audience grew, but so did her critics. She was talking about women's freedom. And in her music, she talked about wanting to be free. While she enjoyed singing, she wanted so much more. She wanted to do more with her life. Vietnam is a one-party communist state. There's only one party. Nothing is contested. Activism is criminalized. Protesters are crushed. The press is censored. Her activist friends told her that she could nominate herself and run as an independent candidate. So she did it. Well, you know, there was huge debate in her country about how could we allow this pop star to run. She was then banned from singing. She asked for a meeting with Obama. She heard he was coming to Vietnam. They put her under 24-hour surveillance. They evicted her from her home. She went into hiding. But when Obama came, she met with him. In 2013, it became so heavy that she fled from her country with her U.S. partner. She lives in Pittsburgh, here in the United States of America. 
she is living in exile. This is where we enter the biblical text today. We talk a lot about the Judeans living in exile. The text today, Jeremiah 29, is the capture and destruction of the city of Jerusalem by the Babylonian army and a series of deportation and forced migration of Judeans into Babylonian empire, including the deportation in this passage. The exile of Judeans into Babylon did not happen all at once, but in waves and phases. They are forced to resettle in Babylon, a place where they are strangers. People can be exiled from where they physically live, but people can also experience an exile right in their land of origin. This is Disability Awareness Week, and I am learning from this community that often they feel alienated and exiled by the way they are treated right here in their own community. Ableism, which is discrimination in favor of able-bodied people, is real for them. I got a little taste about 12 years ago when my son was confined to a stroller for long pilgrimages. I went to this conference and every time we tried to get into the conference center, we had to go way off to the side up some ramp. I would be talking to people, but I could no longer continue to walk with the people because the disability access put me way off track. And I would end up way off on the side of the building so that I could get the stroller in. But that's just the tip of disability. Access is not just about ramps and elevators, but including people who are differently abled. Intellectually disabled folks are seven times more likely to experience sexual assault, and only 3% of that gets reported. 83% of women with intellectual disability will be assaulted. You can figure that out. Which is to say that our disabled folks are very vulnerable to discrimination, assault, and exile. Some people hear and process and communicate differently because of their disabilities. I was listening to an adult sister this week who is legally blind. And when she was a kid, she explained how she wanted to go to dance camp. She loved dancing. This was no Alvin Ailey or Joffrey dance camp. It's just camp. You pay your money and you go but the camp denied her entry. Camp is something that we often take for granted. You pay, you go, you get a scholarship. Because they responded, they just didn't even know if they could handle her. How would you teach a blind person how to dance? It wasn't her that scared them as much as their disability to handle her. I learned from listening this week to disabled siblings how sometimes they can feel exiled or less than by the way they are treated by society, almost so much so that they hate to speak up for themselves, hate to ask for the extra assistance, hate to be a burden to others. One sister said, we are excluded all the time. When I was in high school, there was this one class of special ed students. They were definitely in exile. They did everything by themselves and they did nothing with the rest of the high school. You notice them and some kids were insensitive enough to make cracks. They had one commerce that they did and that was making popcorn. Have you ever heard that question if you were on an island all by yourself and you could only have one meal, what would it be? For me, it would be popcorn. So of course, this commerce that they were into got a lot of my quarters. Whenever I had some extra money, I'd head over to the special ed section and buy some popcorn. But I wonder now, how could our school have integrated them more? We didn't know, honestly. One day I went over to a friend's house and she had this interesting fish. I commented on it. I noticed it appeared that the fish only had one eye. Who goes to the store and gets a fish with one eye? This fish is not right. She said, I know, Charlene. I bought this fish with intention. I wanted my son to understand that we are all different. We are different in so many kinds of ways. I want him to look at this fish and think, I want him to look at this fish and I don't want him to think something is wrong with the fish, but to understand that we are made differently. That experience <laughs> stayed with me. How do we make room for differently abled people in our world? 
in our congregation. It's easy to look over and walk around, isn't it? Exile is not a pleasant space. Many of us have moved, but it is often our own choosing. Like, you know, we decided to move to Chicago to come to college, or we decide to go somewhere, but many more of us have been forced to move without a moment's notice. There are some people that are living in exile. For this community to not have control over one situation was beyond traumatic. To be forced to move, to not have any say so. And Jeremiah offers in this text a word of hope, maybe even encouragement. Make the most, make the most of what you have. That's not an easy pill to swallow, but often this call to follow Jesus is not easy. After being sick last week, my friends gave me a whole lot of advice that I probably didn't want. I don't like advice a lot of the times. So <laughs> told me to take this thing or that thing. So I went on up in Whole Foods, bought $30 worth of vitamin pills, got home with vitamin C, got home with selenium, and got home with magnesium. I opened up the vitamin C pills and I'm like, oh my God, I took one of those things and I thought like, they're trying to choke me, they're trying to kill me. Could they make the pill any, swall any, 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 any smaller? Sometimes the word of God is like a vitamin C pill. It's good for us, but it is a challenge. So I want you guys to hear it today. I want you to hear the challenge. Make the most of what you have. We are inviting you doing stewardship to see generosity all around you, but mostly in you, to see the ways you can share and open up. Jeremiah is inviting them to make the most in the most uncertain times. Hard pill. When things are tough, when things are uncertain, you're telling me to make the most of what I have. The prophetic word in the letter encouraged the exilic community not to abandon themselves to despair or to linger waiting for divine deliverance back to Jerusalem in the near future. The exiled Judeans are called to build, to plant, to eat, to get married, to have children, to make productive contributions, to be generous to the city in which they currently live. Rather than pining for a distant future going back to the homeland, rather than saying, I remember how things used to be. Things are not great. Okay, we get it. Make the most. The right seems to be gaining ground all around us. Make the most of what you have. God is sending us exiled people here. Over the past year, we have had people come from other countries where they have been either exiled from or persecuted. But we also have people that live and worship with us that are exiled. They are alienated build homes, live in your bodies that are wonderfully made, <laughs> whether you got one eye, two eyes, or you're blind. I was recently at a table and it was crowded and it kept getting more crowded and then someone came late and it required us to shift. It required us to move our chairs. It required us to go get another chair. It required us to move so that we could make room for that person at the table. Let us shift our mentality. Let us get the chairs that cause us to be insensitive and indifferent. Let us change. And let us make room for people with disabilities. What a wonderful opportunity. Sometimes we see things as burdens, but now as I'm growing and maturing, I'm learning that sometimes God presents wonderful opportunities. And this is a wonderful opportunity before us to invite exiled people to the table of generosity and to say you are beautiful just the way God made you and we love you. And to really, really make room for the exiled folks of the world here. Amen. <laughs>